Look in your Bible today at Ephesians chapter 6. How many of you have a job uh, outside the home? You work a, a corporate or secular job. You would call it a secular job. Perhaps you work outside the home. Slip your hand way up high. Okay, that's most of us. Uh, listen, uh, all of us are out uh, here in this world. And uh, let me tell you something. This world, <laughs> it's a free-for-all. It's a dog-eat-dog uh, push everybody down, claw your way to the top, bite, devour, whatever you have to do. Uh, it is a hostile world. And uh, the Christian is to uh, have a life living above the fray. Folks will say to me oftentimes, I'll say, how are you doing? I'll say, well, I'm doing pretty well uh, under the circumstances. And I say, well, what are you doing under there? Why are you under the circumstances? It's time to be on top. God has called us to a life of victory. And I want to encourage you this morning on how to live above the fray. Uh, tomorrow is Labor Day. How many of you have to work tomorrow? You have to work on Labor Day, all right? I remember several years ago, uh, we lived in, uh, in Mississippi, and man, Labor Day was coming, and we had, just, we had just started school, and we'd been getting through that first month of school. I was looking for a day off, and uh, I remember... Uh, I kept thinking, man, it's, there's Labor Day coming. Labor Day's coming. We're going to have a great day on Labor Day. I was thinking about what I was going to grill. I was thinking about uh, uh, all the, the kids just laying around the pool, me and the girls, and we'd swim in the pool for a little while, and then we'd eat some watermelon. And uh, On big days like uh, July 4th and Labor Day, we'd throw a watermelon in the swimming pool, and it would just kind of float around with us through the day, and then later on in the day, we'd get out and cut that thing open, and it would taste like pool water. <laughs> but uh, it was just one of our things we did. And I'd grill, and, and I kept thinking, man, it's Labor Day's coming, Labor Day's coming, Labor Day's coming. Well, uh, on Labor Day, my wife got me up early. And I said, sweetheart, you know this is Labor Day. She said, I know. I said, it's a day off. She said, no, it's Labor Day. <laughs> Have you seen our garage? And I said, no, I haven't been in there in months. There's too much junk in there. I'm not going in there. And she said, that's right. We're cleaning that out. So we, we went to labor on Labor Day. Now, for those of you who got to work tomorrow, uh, most of us are going to have a day where we're going to spend a day with our families, perhaps, and some are probably already uh, trying to take advantage of a long weekend. And, uh, but I do want to remind them, this is not the weekend. This is the first day of the week. It might be the weekend on the calendar, but Sunday is the first day of the week, and this is the day we give to the Lord. And uh, so, uh, but many are going to go out to work tomorrow, many of us are going to have a day off tomorrow, but it's, the day is in honor of those who labor and who work. It's a day of rest to honor the hardworking people in the world. And I'm going to talk about that today, because many of us see work perhaps as a drudgery. It's, um, it's just this, uh, what we have to do. We just got to get through the work week. For most people in the world, it's, thank God it's Friday. We got to get to Friday. When I don't have to be in the office and be at work. And uh, everybody uh, just seems to dread going to work. That's not the way it should be for a Christian. In fact, God wants His people to view their jobs as a way to bring glory to God. Now this is just like our God to do this. God takes ordinary people with ordinary talents and He puts them in ordinary places doing ordinary things to get extraordinary glory for Himself. And I believe that many Christians have a wrong view of the way we have to live in this world. Going to work. Some of us dread it. And I want to say this morning, you can live above that fray. You can live above the dog-eat-dog -dog and the grind and the battle of day-to-day -day life, and you can bring a glory to God in a special way. Do you know that we spend one-third to 45% of our working life, our working age, at work? Now, what a shame to spend 45% of our working years at work feeling discouraged, depressed, despondent, and, uh, and just feeling like we're just getting through. That's not how God made us. That's not what God wants us to do. 
So I don't want to spend that much of my life at my job just doing a job. I want to do a work for the Lord. And so if you're going to do that, then there's some principles we've got to live by. Let's look at the scripture today. Ephesians chapter 6. The Apostle Paul's talking about a spirit-filled life. Back in Ephesians 5, he said, be filled with the Spirit. And Paul begins to tell us uh, where to be filled with the Spirit. In our homes, husbands, love your wives. Wives, uh, love your husbands and, uh, and submit to your husbands. And, and children, obey your parents. Parents, love your children. Fathers, provoke not your children to wrath. He's giving us all the areas in our homes, in our marriages, where we are to be Spirit-filled. And then he says in chapter 6 and verse number 5, servants. Now in today's vernacular, that would be this, employees. Be obedient to them that are your masters. In today's vernacular, that would be your bosses. Be obedient to them that are your bosses according to the flesh. With fear, that's respect, and trembling, in singleness of your heart as unto Christ. Now, I didn't say it. The Bible said it. The Bible said you're supposed to see your boss as though your boss was Jesus. You say, you don't know my boss. Well, I don't know your boss. But you're supposed to see that boss in the stead of Jesus, and you're supposed to do for that boss what you would do if it was Jesus. Look at verse number 6. Not with eye service. Now, don't just be working when he's watching. Don't just be busy when you're being observed. And as men pleasers, don't be in there trying to move up through flattery and trying to make that boss, you know, speaking things and and just flattering the boss and, and being one of those kind of people that just trying to move up the ladder with flattery and platitudes and all that kind of stuff. He said, not as men pleasers, but as the servants of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart, with good will doing service, with good will doing your job, as to the Lord and not to men. Listen, you're not working for HP. You're working for Jesus. You're not working, you're not working for... Uh, you're not working for a, a Front Range Baptist Church or Front Range Baptist Academy. You're working for Jesus. You're not working for plumbing, heating, and air. Uh, you're working for Jesus. You're not working at that daycare. You're working for Jesus. You understand? He said, I want you to see your, your masters, your bosses, as though they were Christ and do your job for the Lord. Look at verse number 8. Knowing... That whatsoever good thing any man doeth, the same shall he receive of the Lord, whether he be bond or free. And ye masters, you bosses, do the same thing unto your employees. Forbearing threatening, don't threaten them, knowing that your master also is in heaven, neither is there any respect of persons with him. You know, the Lord doesn't play favorites with his employees. God didn't have a favorite servant. Do you know that if you're at prayer time and I go to prayer time, God doesn't stop listening to you to hear me? Uh, God doesn't play favorites. And we shouldn't play favorites. And right here in this passage of Scripture, God is going to give us three principles in this passage of Scripture to tell you how to live above the daily grind. How not to live discouraged, despondent, depressed, because you have to go to work and punch that clock and work for that old boss who's a taskmaster. God said, I want you, you can be able to walk in that place and whistle and sing and bring glory to Almighty God. You can do it in your job. Let me give you these three principles. Number one, you need to see your job as a God-given opportunity. You need to see your job as a God-given opportunity. Listen, if you have a job, be thankful you have the job. You say, well, I don't really like my job. That's okay. God gave you that job. Be thankful for that job. There are a lot of people who would love to have your job. There are some of us today that we're driving a car that we, that we don't like, but there'd be somebody to give anything to have that car. There are some of us that are working a job we don't want to work, but there'd be other people who'd love to have that job. And so God said, look, this is the opportunity I've given to you. And so if you want to live above the daily grind, if you want to live above all the fray, you want to live above all the backstabbing and office politics and all the things that go on, 
You view your job, you see your job, you tell yourself that my job is a God-given opportunity. God has given me this job, and I'm going to do this job as unto the Lord. Now, listen, there are a few ways that people see their job. Some see a job as a necessary evil. Well, i got to pay the bills, i got to go to work, i got to get through this. I mean, it's just the way society is. It's our culture. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, a, a system that we've developed. Um, and so we, I've got to go to work, got to pay the man, got to pay the taxes, got to do my job, and I've got to go to the grind, put my nose to the grindstone. They see their job as a necessary evil. Some view their job as a harsh taskmaster. <laughs> I mean, they just feel like they're under the, under the weight of the job. They feel depressed about it. They'd love to get out of it, but they can't get out of it. They'd love to go find another job, but they can never get time off to go find another job. And I mean, they just feel whipped and beat up all the time by their job. But some see their job as their God. Some worship their career. I mean, job is God. Uh, my job provides for me. My job pays my bills. My job is everything. And here, by the way, it's in our hearts that when we have a God, there's no sacrifice too little for our God. So people sacrifice their, their health. People sacrifice their families. People sacrifice all kinds of things to do their job. Because job is God. By the way, that's a wrong view of a job. A job should not be a drudgery. A job should not be the daily grind. A job should not just be an evil taskmaster. A job should not be our God. A job is a God-given opportunity that God has given you to bring glory to Him, to serve Him. <laughs> so, that's number one. You need to see your job as a God-given opportunity. Number two, you need to see your job as a God-given responsibility. It's a God-given responsibility. Look with me in verse, number, in verse number six. Not with eye service as men pleasers, but as the servants of Christ. Doing the will of God from the heart. Your job is the will of God for you. Now, I, I'm telling you, I've been in the ministry for a long time. And, um, and I, I, I've seen people get saved. Uh, they get in church, maybe get some spiritual renewal, spiritual fire in their heart. And here's what happens. They come to me and say, uh, Pastor, man, I'd love to quit my job and go full-time in the ministry. I want to be a full-time. I want to work at the church. I want to work in the ministry. I want to work somewhere where I can serve God full-time. And uh, now listen, if God's calling you to do that, then that's one thing. But some view it that they have to work at the church and, uh, and uh, work, work in, uh, work in full-time ministry in order to be a full-time minister for the Lord. But that's not true. That's not true. You see, work that God gave you. We, we, divide, we divide things in our world, in, as Christians, we divide things in spiritual and secular. Now, can you imagine Jesus doing that? You know, Jesus had a job. Uh, Jesus was a carpenter. He worked, for, uh, he worked for his stepfather, Joseph, as a carpenter. And can you see Jesus dividing his life into the spiritual and the secular? No, everything that Jesus did was spiritual. And by the way, if Christ is in you, then everywhere you go is spiritual. Everything you do is spiritual. It's to be done as unto the Lord. See, and a job is a responsibility that God's given you to fulfill the will of God for your life. Let me, let me remind you something. Listen to me very carefully. Now, just sit right up straight. Now, now I'm going to tell you this. There are a lot of problems in our world today. And this might seem like a very benign message. This is one of the most vital messages that Christians will ever hear. And I'll tell you why. If more Christians would understand this principle and they would live this out, what I'm preaching today, if they'd live this out in their lives, if Christians would go to work on Monday with what I'm preaching today from the Word of God, if Christians would go to work on Monday with that attitude, then the people would believe more what I say on Sunday. But one of the reasons why people don't believe what the preacher says on Sunday is because of the way Christians show up for work on Monday. Do you know what the greatest mission field in the world is? The greatest mission field in the world is where Christians go to work on Monday morning. The greatest mission field is where Christians go to work on Monday morning. 
And many of us find ourselves going to work with the same attitude and the same spirit as our unsaved co-workers go to work with. And we get involved in the same, in the same attitudes, the same politics, all those things that go on in the corporate world. We find ourselves uh, bringing, and by the way, we can bring shame to the name of Christ. Now, I'm telling you, with all the problems in our world today, if God's people would just go to work on Monday morning with the right heart and the right attitude to bring glory to God, I believe we'd see revival in our country. I believe that. Now, I want you to understand, to understand this, you need to realize this. Work was not a result of the fall of man in the garden. We, we did not fall into sin and God said, okay, now you've got to go to work. The only result of sin was sweat and toil and thorns and thistles. In other words, now in your work, there are going to be some difficulties in the work. There are going to be thorns to deal with. There's going to be briars to deal with. You're going to sweat now. It's going to be exerting. You're going to have to give of yourself now. Uh, before, it was a joy to serve God in the garden. Now it's going to be a job to serve God. But listen, it is still what God called us to do. Some people think that work was a result of sin. We have to go to work because uh, it's, just the, it's because of a broken world. No. Work was, was something God designed to get glory for himself. Now, don't answer this out loud, but does anybody know who the first farmer was? Now, if you're thinking, if you're not thinking, you'll say, well, it was Adam. He was the first farmer. Well, he wasn't. The first farmer was God. Listen to what the Bible says in Genesis chapter 2 and verse number 8. And the Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden, and there he put the man whom he had formed. Here's what God did. God became a farmer, and he planted a garden. And then God put the man in the garden and said, Now, Adam, I want you to keep that garden. I want you to tend to this garden. I want you to keep this garden up for me. And I'm going to come into your work every day, and I'm going to walk with you. I'm going to fellowship with you. And I'm going to see the handiwork that you've done in keeping up my garden. Now, you see, listen. Uh, when God put Adam in that garden and told him, to tend it and to keep it, Adam was not doing <laughs> secular work. Now, we would call that secular work. He's a farmer. I mean, listen, he's not working at the temple. God didn't build a temple and a tabernacle and then say, Adam, I want you to go in there and be a high priest and go in there and offer sacrifices to me. No. God <laughs> became a farmer. He planted a garden, put Adam in that garden to do what we would call secular work. And God said, Adam, I want you to tend that garden, keep that garden for me. And Adam was actually doing ministry. He was not working secular work. He was working ministry work. You know why? Because he was obeying the voice of the Lord and doing the work of God. This is what Ephesians chapter 6, verse 6 tells us. That when you go to work tomorrow, you need to go as the will of God. You're doing the will of God for your life. It's God's will for you to have that job. Listen to what the Bible says in Colossians chapter 3, verse 23 and 24. Write these references down. Colossians 3, 23 and 24. And whatsoever you do, do it heartily as unto the Lord. Whatever you do, do it heartily as unto the Lord. Now, by the way, if what you're doing can't be done for the Lord, then you ought not to be doing it. But if what you're doing can be done for the Lord, then you better put your whole heart in it and do it as unto the Lord and not unto men knowing that of the Lord you shall receive the reward of the inheritance, for ye serve the Lord Christ. Let me tell you something, you, 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 you uh, high school students, you're not doing your homework for the teacher. You're doing your homework for the Lord. You're doing your homework as unto Christ. Now, you might be able to slip by and get by with the teacher, but can I tell you something? You need to put 100% of your work into what you do because you're doing it on the Lord. Every time you sit down to do your homework, you ought to say, Lord, I want to do this pleasing to you. And you give it all you've got. Listen, some of you might have a teacher that's just hard to deal with. We've all had them. How many of you remember the teacher that was hard to deal with when you were coming up? How many of you remember that teacher? Yes. How many of you remember the teacher that was so kind and gracious and helpful to you? And they, yes, we remember those teachers too. And then there are just the in-betweens. There's the teachers that you just don't remember because you slept through their class. 
Let me help you something. Let me help you something with a teacher that you don't like. Hey, let me help you something with a principal that you may not agree with. Instead of going to your locker and talking bad about the principal, go to your locker and talk good about Jesus. And see that teacher as though that teacher were the Lord. See that boss as though he were or she were the Lord. And do your work as unto the Lord. You say, yeah, but I'm living in a wicked place. I work in a terrible place. People use bad language. They blaspheme the name of God. There's office politics. It's ungodly where I work. In fact, sometimes I think people are even doing things unethically. And it's just awful where I live. Well, let me tell you what the Lord said about His people living in Babylon. In Genesis 29, verse number 4 through 9, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, unto all that are carried away captives. And by the way, can I tell you, that's us. We are the people of God living in a world. We are captivated in a world that is the God of this world is Satan himself. And we are here as captives. Now watch this. But God said, whom I have caused to be carried away. See, let me tell you what happened to Israel. Israel had a hard time handling God's blessings. So God had to design some trouble for them. Took them away captive for 70 years. Can I tell you, I believe America's having a hard time handling God's blessings. And so God's designed some trouble for us. God's designed some trouble to get God's people to remember that He's the one in control. And that we might be living in Babylon, but we are under the hand of God. Now here's what He said to His people who were living in that place. Build ye houses and dwell in them. Plant gardens and eat the fruit of them. Take ye wives and beget sons and daughters and take wives uh, for your sons and give your daughters to husbands that they may bear sons and daughters that ye may be increased there and not diminished and seek the peace of the city whither I have caused you to be carried away captives and pray unto the Lord for it. For in the peace thereof ye shall have peace. Let me tell you something. It would change our whole perspective if we got up on Monday morning and we said, God, I'm going to work today. I'm praying for my company. I pray for my bosses. Lord, give my bosses discernment and, and decisions they'll make for the company. God, I pray for my coworkers today. I pray that I'll have the right spirit to bring a peace in that place. Lord, help me not to be part of division. Help me not to be, be part of politics and backstabbing and, and dividing one against the other. God, I pray for my teachers today. Let my teachers be able to teach me. Give me ears to hear what they're teaching me today. I pray for my administrator that you'll bless him or her and help them to administrate this school uh, with wisdom that our school can stay open. And God, I pray today that I will seek the peace that I won't be going to my locker and speaking evil about other people and dividing and trashing that teacher and talking down about that rule. I pray I won't go to the water cooler and be part of the gossip of the office and backbite that coworker. God, help me today to seek the peace of this city, that in this place I will have peace. You know, you know it's, it's interesting to me. You know that employees that go into their jobs and cause trouble in their jobs, that's like somebody uh, spitting in their own food. I had an uncle years ago, Montana uncle. He, boy, this guy was tough as nails. He died when I was just a boy, but I, there's two things I remember about my uncle. First of all, he had a big hula hoop. He had a hula girl on his, on his bicep tattoo. And he'd get me and my brothers down, and he'd flex his muscle, make that hula, do the, that hula girl do the hula. And my mom would get so mad. She'd say, Don, don't you get my boys corrupted. Get away from Uncle Don. Don't you look at his arm. And then he'd hula that girl. I remember that. And the other thing I remembered is he would chew tobacco. And as he was sipping coffee, he'd spit his tobacco juice back in the coffee cup. And I never could understand, why are you spitting it out if you're just going to drink it back in? Why do we have to see it? I mean, that's just, I mean, chewing tobacco is one thing. You know, you, you, they, they look... People who chew tobacco look like a happy motorcycle rider. They open their mouth and they just got, looks like they got bugs in their teeth. <laughs> and he'd spit that tobacco back in his cup, making that hula girl dance. I said, let me tell you something. If that hula girl could see what you're spitting in your coffee, she'd go to your back. That's exactly what she'd do. Now, I have no idea why I told you that. 
<laughs> except to say that my Uncle Don <laughs> would, would spit in his own coffee. Can I tell you, when we go to our school and we trash our teachers and our administrator, all we're doing is we're, we are spitting in our own food. When we go to work and we cause trouble in the work, we are polluting our own air. And God said, don't do that. There's already enough. Listen, Babylon knows how to fight. Babylon knows how to sin. Babylon knows how to corrupt itself. So the people of God need to just go and live a peaceable life. Build a house. Plant a garden. Marry and have children. Raise your families. Pray for your city. Be in peace with your city. And just enjoy it. Why? Because they're going to all be at war with each other. You need to bring peace. You're different. God's people need to come in that place and be different. You know, I, I meet people who say, Man, I wish I could win the lottery. And then if I won the lottery, I'd never have to work my job again. Can I tell you something? If you had a million dollars in the bank and you had a million dollars in, in cash under your pillow, if you had all the money in the world, you still ought to go to work. Listen, you ought to still work. You say, why? Because God made you to work. Uh, work was something that was given to us by God. Listen to what the Bible says. Now, I'm talking about, I'm talking about the Scripture. The Word of God. Listen to this. 2 Thessalonians 3. Verse number 10, for even when we were with you, this we commanded you, that if any would not work, neither should he eat. Do you know that you are going against the plan of God when we give food to somebody who won't work? I mean, God doesn't want, God doesn't want, he, God wants men to work. And if a man won't work, now I didn't, he didn't, the Bible didn't say that he can't work. Man, the Bible says if he won't work, there's a difference. There's a world of difference between a man who can't work and a man who won't work. But he said, he said, this we command you, that if a man won't work, neither should he eat. Now watch this. For we hear that there are some which walk among you disorderly, working not at all, but are busybodies. Now them that are such we command and exhort by our Lord Jesus Christ, and watch this, that with quietness they work and eat their own bread. God gave you a job as a personal responsibility to take care of yourself. It is not society's job to take care of us. Uh, the, our framers, when they put in the Constitution to seek the general welfare, they did not have in mind that we would just send checks to people who won't work. That's a sin against God. Do you know that even in, do you know, you know, let me tell you about God's welfare system in the Old Testament. God's welfare system in the Old Testament was this. You men, Boaz, that have a lot of food and you've got a lot of land and you've got a lot of crops, when you go in to harvest your crops, you let the widows and the poor and the fatherless come into your fields and go behind your harvesters and let them glean from the fields. Let them pick up what has fallen down. And he said, and not only that, <clears throat> when you go to harvest your fields, don't harvest the corners. The corners of the field, let that be for the poor. Now listen, he did not say to the farmers, go harvest your fields after you've plowed it, after you've planted it, after you've prayed over it, after you've watered it, after you've picked it. Now don't go package it up in boxes and send it to the poor. Let them have dignity to come and work with their hands. There is a dignity in work. My heart breaks. I look at these men that stand on the side of the road with a sign. Uh, the other day, my daughter and I pulled up, and there's a man standing at the street corner in Loveland, and he's got a sign. And the, the, his sign had a paragraph on it, written out on this sign. And here's the opening letters of his sign. I've not always been a bum. But, and then it went into this big sob story about how he became a bum. And he said down there, if you can have anything to help a bum. Now here's a man standing on the street corner saying, I'm a bum. I've lost my dignity. I've lost a way to have value in myself. And so I'm going to stand here as a bum. And ask for a handout. I wasn't mad at that man. My heart broke for that man. But I know enough about it to know that we, I'm not going to give him cash. Because I'll tell you something right now. Listen to me very carefully. There are two types of poor in the world. The Bible tells us very clearly. Number one, the devil has his poor. 
The devil has his poor. They've been impoverished through vice, drugs, alcohol. They've been imprisoned. They've got records. They can't find a job. And these are the devil's poor. They've become poor through sin. Let me tell you what they need. They need our Christ. They need, listen to me, communism will look at a man like that and say, hey, if we would just go into a communist society, we could put a new coat on that man. Christianity looks at that man and says, if they trust Christ, we could put a new man in that coat. God wants to make that man new. And so the devil's poor that have been made poor through sin and wickedness. They need Christ. And we need to have compassion upon them and give them the gospel. Listen, do you know how many people put five bucks in their hand and all they've done is bought a fifth of whiskey with it and gone right back to the street? And they've been made none the better? How about when Peter and John were going to the temple and they saw that beggar laying on the side of the road and he said, uh, he stuck out his palm and asked for an alm. And Peter said, silver and gold have I none. You've had a ton of silver and a ton of gold go through that hand. I'm not giving you it. But what I have is Jesus. And Jesus made that man new. We need to have compassion and give the gospel. But then the Bible says, Jesus said to the church, the poor you have with you always. They're with you. They sit with, among us. There are people that God has given them the ministry of suffering, the ministry of poverty, perhaps. There are people that come, they come to church, they faithfully serve the Lord, but they just, they just never have the ability to gather means. And you know what? God has put them there for us to be able to show them the charity of the Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord's poor need our charity. The devil's poor need our Christ. Everybody understand that? There's a difference. There's a difference. And we ought to be giving to the poor. We ought to be doing what we can. But God said, listen to me, if a man won't work, he, he shouldn't eat. You need to labor with quietness that you can eat of your own bread that you've earned with your own hands because there's dignity in that. God gave you a job for you to have personal value. I'm telling you, this generation that's sitting now and they're demanding the government to give, 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 give. They'll go into the streets, they'll break windows, they'll burn, they'll pillage, they'll destroy for their own way, and they lose their dignity. Go to, go to communist Russia, behind the Iron Curtain, when, 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 when communism was full-fledged in Russia. Go there and see the people who've been devalued stripped of their dignity as human beings go to uh, go to venezuela and see grown men digging in the trash looking for something to eat stripped of their dignity because the government just said well we'll take care of you god didn't design it that way god designed a man to have personal responsibility take care of himself not only that listen to what the bible says in first timothy chapter 5 and verse number 8 but if any man provide not for his own, and especially for those of his own house, he hath denied the faith and is worse than an infidel. God said not only does a man have a personal responsibility to take care of himself, but he's also got a responsibility to take care of his family. He said if a man won't take care of his own family, that man has denied the faith, and he is in worse condition than a man who is an infidel, a God denier. I've met men like that. I've been in places in the deep south where I've, I've been in places that were so impoverished and you see these little kids and they're living in just, they're living in rubbish. You see them running around, they've got roach bites all over their bodies. No shoes, no food. You see dad sitting out there on the porch in an old broken down chair chugging on his big old fifth of whiskey he's got his booze and the kids have no shoes worse than an infidel god said a man ought to go to work and he ought to take care of his family but i like this too we also have an, we also have a responsibility to take care of one another look at what the bible says ephesians 4 verse 28 let him that stole steal no more stealing getting things that are not ours should never be named among the church. Let him that stole steal no more. But rather let him labor, working with his hands the thing which is good that he might have to give to him that needeth. Listen, a Christian ought to have an attitude of giving. And there are times we're going to come across people who have need. And we're going to give to those who have need. And we ought to have 
We have to have something to give to those who are in need because we've labored. God says, listen, a job is not only a God-given opportunity, but it's a God-given responsibility to take care of yourself, to take care of your family, and to take care of those who may be in need. Do you know that we wouldn't need all the government programs if God's people would just do what God's people are supposed to do? God's already designed a way for the church to be able to help in this world. Uh, and so God said it's an opportunity and it's a responsibility. Let me give you the third thing and lastly. If you're going to live by the fray, now listen to me, here it is. This is where we're going to get right to the conclusion. This is where it is. You need to see your job as a god given ministry <laughs> you say working at costco working at sam's club working at the dentist office it's a god-given it's a god-given responsibility you mean working for walmart that's a god-given ministry it's a ministry you say but yeah but Listen, I, I'd, I'd love to quit my secular job and get into the ministry. Listen, if you've got a job, you have a ministry. You say, but I'd love to work at the church. Listen, do you know that when I go out in public and I talk to people, I try, to, I try not to let them find out that I'm a pastor? Not because I'm ashamed of being a pastor. I never deny the fact that I'm a Christian. But I don't want them to know that I'm a pastor. You know why? I don't want my neighbors and my friends and people I sit down next to on an airplane to think that I'm a, I'm a hit man for Jesus. That I'm a hired, that I'm a hired man who, who gets paid to, to give the gospel. I don't love Jesus because I get a paycheck to love Jesus. I don't preach for Jesus because I get paid to preach for Jesus. Listen, I was preaching a long time before I ever got a paycheck. I'll never forget the first time I ever preached and somebody gave me money for it. I'd, I'd go down, I'd go down on a, in Colorado Springs, I'd go down to Acacia Park and preach on the, preach on the street. I'd get a, I had a bus, a Sunday school bus. I'd load up a bunch of kids on that bus. I'd get on that bus and I'd preach to them. I was always trying to find places to preach. I'd drive 80 miles from Colorado Springs up to Watkins, Colorado every Monday night. I went to the big, biggest, it was the biggest truck stop in Colorado. I went to the Tomahawk truck stop. I was, uh, I was 18 years old. I walked in, I met the general manager. I said, sir, I'm a preacher. And God's called me to preach. I'd like to come to your truck stop and preach. He said, well, well we can't do that. I said, yeah, you can. Here's, a, here's what you can do. You've got an old CB room back there that nobody's using anymore. And it's just old, dusty room. And I said, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll come in there and I'll clean that room out. I'll refresh it. I'll repaint it. I'll put new carpet in it. I'll make it look real nice. And we'll have a truck driver chapel. How about that? He said, you'll do that? I said, I'll do it. He said, how much you charge? I said, nothing. I said, if you'll just give me the opportunity, I'll take it. He said, okay, you can have it. If you clean that room out, he said, that thing's been an eyesore and it's a junk room. Boy, was he not kidding. I got in that place, cleaned it all out, pulled all that old carpet out, went and, and got some carpet. I, I went to a carpet store, found a remnant of carpet that they had, said, would you just give me this thing? <laughs> they gave it to me. I put that remnant of carpet in there. I'd go up to that truck stop on Monday afternoons, and I'd start knocking doors. I'd go truck to truck, knock doors. I didn't know those guys were in there napping. I thought they were, I thought they were just stopping to get some gas, and I didn't realize they were in there sleeping. I didn't know anything about truck drivers. I just knew there was a huge truck stop, people coming in all the time. I'd knock on the door, a guy opened the door, yeah, I can help you. Hey, listen, I, my name's Dean Miller. We're going to be having a time for truck driver chapel. We're going to have time to, to sing and to fellowship and worship, and, uh, and I'm going to preach the gospel in a little bit. Why don't you join me? Seven o'clock. Okay, yeah, whatever, man. <laughs> and they close the door. I'd go truck to truck to truck to truck. I went in, I asked the general manager, I said, can I make an announcement on your loudspeaker? He said, what do you want to say? I said, I want to tell everybody I'm having chapel in a minute. He said, okay, that'd be fine. I got on the loudspeaker. Uh, uh, tension drivers, tension drivers. Uh, in 15 minutes, chapel starting in the chapel room, right outside the driver's lounge. Uh, all the drivers, welcome to come to chapel. Man, let me tell you something. We gather in three, four, five, six, seven truck drivers in there. I'd meet these guys. I'd stand up there and I'd preach the dickens out of those guys. I remember the first time I went to a church and I preached. Man, I was so excited. I preached after the church after the service. Man, hand me an envelope. I said, Well, thank you. I didn't know what it was. I stuck it in my Bible. I left, got in the car, I'm driving down the road. I opened up. It was $35. Man, I pulled over and I said, $35 for what? I looked at the bottom, a little memo said, love offering. 
that church didn't know how to love very well, but they love me. <laughs> I remember, I, I, I remember just crying, saying, Lord, I just preached, and I got $35. And I didn't know what to do with it. I didn't know, I, I thought, I, then it made me mad. I felt like a hireling. I said, man, no one's going to pay me. I'm not for sale. Bless God. I don't preach for money. Now listen, I, I'm, I'm telling you the truth. I sit down next to people, and they'll say, hey, what do you do for a living? I said, well, um, uh, I, I speak for a living. Oh, really? I said, in fact, I'm going right now. I'm going to speak, I'm going to speak for, uh, for, for a group of teenagers, and, and uh, I'm going to speak to teenagers. And, and then I ask them, what do you do? And I try to get the subject off. I don't want them to think that I'm going to give the gospel because I'm the hired gun. I want them to know that I'm going to give the gospel because I love Jesus. Now listen, you don't need to just bring people into church so that a professional can tell them about Jesus Christ. You need to be telling people about Jesus Christ. And you're in the ministry. Listen, you cannot divide your life into the spiritual and the secular. If you're saved, everywhere you go, you're on holy ground. Everywhere you go, you're on holy ground. Well, most people today, many Christians, most Christians are just drawing a breath and drawing a salary and we're just hoping to get through the week. I, I heard about a little boy went to his mom one day and she said, Mom, can I, he said, Mama, can I have $10? She said, for what? She said, for being good. She said, why can't you be like your dad and be good for nothing? <laughs> now listen, we don't serve in the ministry to get a paycheck. We ought to be serving for the Lord from the heart. Too many Christians come to church on Sunday and we worship God and then we get over it and go to work on Monday and grumble. Can I tell you the secret to the Christian life is getting your Sunday into your Monday. Getting your, getting your Sunday into Tuesday and Wednesday and Thursday and Friday. Somehow we've bridged we have a bridge. We have, our, we have our worship life and then we have our work life. Let me tell you something. You need some spiritual dynamite. Blow that bridge to smithereens and, and join those two together. Your job is your ministry for Jesus Christ. Listen to me. Now, doesn't, now, doesn't this put dignity into work when he says, with goodwill doing service as to the Lord and not to men? Doesn't that put dignity into your job? You say, ah, just it's the old daily grind. Got to go work for the man. No, I'm going to work today to serve Jesus. That puts some dignity into what we do. I think about Daniel. Now, I'm almost done, but I think about Daniel. Oh, Daniel. He was a, you know that Daniel was a government employee in the government of Babylon? Daniel worked in the government of Babylon, one of the most godless, wicked places a man could serve. And Daniel worked in the government. And they were going to throw Daniel to the lion's den for praying. And King Darius went to see him before he went to the lion's den. And this is what, this is what Darius told Daniel in Daniel chapter 6 and verse 16. Then the king commanded and they brought Daniel and cast him into the den of lions. Now the king spake unto Daniel and said, Thy God whom thou servest continually he will deliver thee. Do you know that Darius did not believe that Daniel worked for him? Darius knew that Daniel was doing his job for God. And he said, that God that you serve continually, he'll deliver you. Now listen, you might be surrounded by all kinds of things in your job. Profane, ungodly, wicked things. But can I tell you something right now? God did not save you to take you out of the world. Don't miss this. God saved you out of the world. He sanctified you, set you apart as His. Then He sent you back into the world to go work in the world, to go be a witness to the world until He comes to call you out of this world. That's the only occupation you have. You say, well, yeah, but my job, they're full of wicked things. Well, that's what sinners do. You know that none of us, none of us have been sitting at the house and our dog bark and we say, oh, can you believe that dog barked? We've never been surprised when a cow moos. Mm. Did you hear that cow moo? Well, cows moo, dogs bark, and sin or sin. And God called us to go into this world. Let me tell you what, let me tell you what Jesus prayed about you. In John 17 and verse 15, this is what Jesus prayed about you. He said, now, Father, I pray not that thou shouldest take them out of the world. 
but thou, thou shouldest keep them from the evil. Don't take them out of the world. Just protect them while they're in the world so they can be a witness for you in this world. That's what, that's what Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 9 and 10. Paul said, I wrote in you an epistle not to company with fornicators. He said, I did write to you and tell you, don't fellowship with fornicators. I told you that. You should not company with fornicators in the church. Yet not all together with the fornicators of this world, or with the covetous, or with the extortioners, or with idolaters. For then you must needs go out of the world. He said, now when I told you not to company with fornicators, I'm talking about not allowing sin to exist in the open in the church. It ought not to be named in the church. We ought to be living in sexual sin in the church. He said, but listen, you can't get away from all of it. If you were going to get away from all the fornicators and all the covetous and all the extortioners and all the idolaters, you'd have to get out of this world. God said, I'm sending you back in this world. That's why Paul told us. He said, be not overcome with evil, but overcome evil with good. That's why John said, and this is the victory that overcomes the world, even our faith. God saved us out of the world, sanctified us, and sent us back into the world to be the salt and the light. You know what I believe? I believe too many Christians come in here and we're, we're, we shine our lights on each other and we salt each other. But friend, like one old pastor used to say, you, can't, you don't put the fish in one barrel and the salt in the other. We've got to get the salt and the light out of this place and go take the light to those that are in darkness and the salt to those who are in sin and that's why Paul said in Philippians 2.15 that you may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God, without rebuke, in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation among whom ye shine as lights in the world. Now, I'm going to close with this. Don't miss it. Let me give you four attitudes to go to work tomorrow. Ready? Four commandments for work. Number one, when you go to work, well, maybe you're not going to work tomorrow, maybe Tuesday. <laughs> but when the next time you go to your job, number one, don't boast. Don't boast. Don't walk in there with an attitude about how holy you are and how good you are and how you don't do this, you don't do that, you're this and you're that and you're this good. And don't have a boastful attitude. Don't boast. Number two, don't roast. You say, what do you mean by that? Don't go in there and say, hey, you ought not be doing that. You shouldn't do that. You shouldn't do that. And uh, you ought not to be playing the lottery. Don't you be gambling. Don't, don't, don't go to... Don't. Listen, Jesus did not come into the world to condemn the world. But that the world through him might be saved. Nobody wants you to go to your job, get on a soapbox, and just roast everybody and tell them how bad they are. <laughs> so don't, don't boast how good you are. Don't roast them for how bad they are. <laughs> don't coast. The Bible says, whatsoever you do, do it heartily as unto the Lord. Don't be a slacker at your job. You know, it, it's a shame. People ought to be going to the employment agencies and saying, listen, you got any men that can come work for me? And by the way, send all the Christians you have. Those people are unusual. They show up early. They work, their, uh, they work all day. I mean, they'll stay overtime if needs be. They have the best attitude. They are the most helpful, productive people that I've ever had. If you got Christians, send them over here. I want my job filled with those kind of people. They know how to work. Don't coast. Don't go to work and coast through the day. Don't boast, don't roast, don't coast. I like this one. Don't be milk toast. M I L Q U E T O A S T. Don't be milk toast. Say, what is milk toast? It's a compromiser. Don't go to work and give in to sin. Hey, listen, you don't have to condemn them for the dirty stories, but you don't have to tell them. You don't, have to, you, 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 you don't need to point an accusing finger at the world and condemn them for what they do, but don't join them. You don't have to use foul language and gossip, backbite. Don't give in. Take your stand. I remember one of the first jobs I ever had, secular job, I was working as a maintenance man for Ramada Inn. Listen, I can't hardly change a light bulb. And they made me the maintenance man for the Ramada Inn. That place was falling apart. They didn't even know it. But I remember my first year there, I got my job after I got out of high school. It was June, and that meant I was trying to learn how to do that job. Well, here comes the Christmas holiday. And they said, we're having a Christmas party. And so I went to the Christmas party. And man, oh man, I'd never seen so much booze in all my life. We had it downstairs at the, at the Ramada Inn, down where the bar was. And I mean, it was flowing like the Mississippi River. 
and, uh, and people were offering me all kinds of stuff to drink. I said, no, thank you, no, thank you. I don't drink, I don't drink, I don't drink. And can I tell you what happened? From that moment on, it became everybody's goal to get me the first drink. And I said no. Not because I was a good Christian. I was still living at home. Dad would have killed me. I'm not saying this because I'm the hero. I'm just telling you. Everybody was trying to get me to drink. They'd say, hey, come get a drink with us. I said, well, I don't drink. Oh, you're a goody two-shoes. You're a teetotaler. You're the preacher. You're a deacon. They'd call me all kinds of names. But can I tell you something? After I'd been there for a while, and I got to lead, stand to Christ, and then a young man by the name of James came to see me one day, and he said, hey, I'm going through some problems. thought I'd come and talk to you. Maybe you could help me. And I got to take the Bible and show James how to get saved. And I, can I tell you something? Uh, don't, don't compromise. Just live for Christ. You say, well, I can't do all that. No, you can't. You can't. You see, there's only been one who's ever lived the Christian life. And his name is Jesus. And if you're going to live that Christian life at home or at the job, it's going to be Jesus and you. You can't do this until you've been born again. If you don't know Jesus Christ as a personal Savior today, you need to open your heart and life and say, Jesus, come in and save me. Forgive me my sin. You need to be born again. And if you are saved, you need to say, Lord, let me die to self and let Jesus Christ live in me.